This podcast was sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be tuned in. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we're back again for another COVID edition of the Vickers Crossing. We've been enjoying uh, having an opportunity to do this on Zoom over the last uh, few weeks. And we're going to continue that uh, format as long as we can. So it's great to to be able to connect uh, with people that are outside of our areas we are doing today. So uh, we're going to be welcoming our special guest here in just a minute. My name is Rob Henderson, and I'm the rector and priest at Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church here in London. And uh, my name is Kevin George, and I am the uh, priest and rector at St. Aidan's Church here in London, Ontario as well, and it's good to be back here with you. And I'm Ian. I make all of this sound not bad. Crappy. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Which is a monumental task we've given yeah. him. Kevin and I. And we want to say hi to our sponsor, A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. And we welcome to the Vickers Crossing today our special guest from San Francisco. Sarah Miles is with us. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thanks for having me here. Oh, great. Awesome. It's great to have you. We're thrilled. We're thrilled. We're going to get uh, Kevin to do a bit of a formal introduction coming up here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but before we do that, we just want to check in with each other and see how everybody's uh, coping and, and, and making out these days. So, Kevin, what's what's going on? Oh, gosh, what's not going on, eh, Robbie? Uh, yeah. We're all taken up with the events uh, in our world right now. What's happening uh, in Sarah's country in the United States has sort of gripped all of our attention. Um, and we're not without uh, our own issues here in Canada, as uh, many people in Toronto have uh, been dealing with the death of uh, that young woman, Regis, who was uh, uh, in a conversation with a police officer when she came off a 29-story balcony. Um, and uh, we, as a community, are trying to find a way to respond. Um, so I just, I don't know, Rob, I, what I'm at is I'm trying to remain sane in the midst of a world which seems to be uh, gone mad. But yeah. at the same time, I think that these voices that are now crying are long overdue. And I think it's time that uh, we begin to hear that. I was pleased to see our bishop tweet last night about uh, the need for uh, for a call for us to uh, be accountable, to repent for the ways we participated in systems of racism, mm-hmm. and uh, to hold up the... Uh, those who are, are uh, those voices that right now are trying to speak out. So, yeah, that and I guess the other news is that you and I got yesterday, which is we know we're not going to be back gathering at any time soon, not until at least September. So, right, yeah, we got that news from our host of bishops that uh, the decision was made um, to keep our buildings closed until September. Um, but again, we we emphasize buildings closed, and uh, you know, there's a lot of great ministry still happening, and churches being church, and there's things going on. But there's an understanding that. People are disappointed and they miss their communities, obviously, and they miss the opportunities that we have to gather, which is what we do, and to worship together. Um, but this is where we're going to be, and we're going to continue to, to do the work that we're called to do in our communities. And, and I know, and you know, in your area of London, in my area of London, there's there's still vulnerable folks that we need to be in touch with and, and make sure we can do what we can do to get our folks um, in the churches uh, alongside them and, and walk in. Too, so, so we're gonna yeah. continue to do that. Yeah, Ian, how are you making it, buddy? <sighs> um, all right, <laughs> I'm surviving, which is good. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking this we kind of come to this place and acknowledge it'll come today with heavy hearts, maybe heavy souls. You know, a lot's been happening over the last mm-hmm. months, but certainly over the last 24, 48 hours. And, uh, so we'll try to unpack a little bit of that today and talk to Sarah a little bit about that too. And and uh and get into that a little bit on the vicar's crossing so um so sarah we're thrilled to have you here um and and we're glad you're here we're going to do a little thing with with ian because one of the things on the vicar's crossing that we found over the months that we've been doing this is is despite kevin's uh and i uh desire to to be out in the public square it's really people want to hear what ian has to say 
and uh, sometimes they just want us to shut up. <laughs> so this is, this is a section that we like to call the Vickers Crossing. Or ask Ian, 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 Wow. Asking anything. Asking anything. I A. So do we have a question for Ian? We today? got a question today, buddy. And this one is, uh, uh, Sarah, this often goes from the uh, deeply profound to the absolutely silly and ridiculous. This one airs towards silly and ridiculous. And maybe you know the answer. I don't know if Ian knows the answer or not. But the question for you today, sir, comes from uh, Claire Stewart, who is a priest uh, out in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, where she is the new uh, vicar, uh, uh, interim vicar at the cathedral there. And uh, she says, uh, she's just moved there from rural Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, we live in rural Alberta now, and we can hear cows at night. Mm -hmm. We drive by cows daily. My wife, Jennifer, has asked me today if cows can run. <laughs> Ian, do you know the answer to that? Can cows run? If they're nominated. <laughs> I would think so. I, I don't see why they wouldn't run. Let's put it that way. There's no, I don't know. Where, where would they be running to? I don't know. Where, they have nothing yeah, well, to run for. What if they're running from something? Like Maybe. Running from. Mm. I don't know. Have you ever seen a cow run, Sarah? I have seen a cow run. I believe that um, the male of the species, there's a sport dedicated to it. Ah, very true. Oh, yes. yeah. See, right. there you go. They're, they're running pretty, <laughs> running pretty hard there. That's the truth. There we yeah. go. <laughs> so, Good. See, Good. so there's the answer. We couldn't count on Ian, but we have quality guests here who can answer these questions. <laughs> for the most expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the craziest one we've had in months, Sarah. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's great. Well, Kevin, uh, would you please introduce our special guest today? Because we're just thrilled to have her on board with us. I will do. I will be my pleasure. And I'm very excited because uh, I think as I called it online, a fanboying, geeking out as church geeks to have people like Sarah on this podcast. Sarah is also an author whose books include Take This Bread, A Radical Conversion, Jesus Freak, uh, Feeding, uh, Healing, and Raising the Dead, and City of God, Faith in the Streets. She served as Director of Ministry at St. Gregory Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco for 10 years and is the founder and director of the Food Pantry. You'll find Sarah when it's not COVID time, speaking all over the place, uh, but uh, nowadays we're all doing this from our homes. She preaches, she speaks, she teaches, and she leads workshops around the world. Uh, her political reporting includes uh, the book, How to Hack a Party Line, uh, The Democrats in Silicon Valley. And her journalism has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, and National Public Radio. And it is our distinct pleasure to have on our podcast today, Sarah Miles. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm yeah. really happy to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you. Well, let's uh, go to the most immediate thing first. Um, being as uh, you are, um, uh, you are as articulate as you are about faith in the public square and how we might be present. Uh, we'll start by saying his name, George Floyd. Um, the outrage over the murder of George Floyd has erupted in protests across America. In fact, here in Canada, as far away as New Zealand, uh, people are taken to the streets in outrage over what we all witness. Um, a couple of days ago, um, you shared an image, uh, which I'll have uh, Ian put into this uh, when, when he edits it up. Uh, the image uh, was an icon, uh, which was... Um, which was fashioned by Mark Dukes, I believe. Yes. And your tweet said, fuck the police in Jesus' name, um, which somehow or another gave me comfort uh, <laughs> and, uh, to know that somebody, is, somebody is, is speaking out that lament and that cry. And I know many are. Uh, your voice is added to them. Uh, can you tell us what you've been feeling since witnessing what we all witnessed with George Floyd and and how you're feeling, and perhaps a little bit of what's the situation where you are right now, and how are people responding? Well, you know, this is what I've been witnessing my entire life, mm. right? So it's not that there's some new issue that all of a sudden has upset me. Um, what happened with the murder of George, George Floyd is really in a way what happened with the coronavirus, right? It is apocalyptic 
in that it reveals what was there already. It mm -hmm. rips the veil away from what we don't want to see and what we don't want to acknowledge. And what we don't want to see is that this is a fundamentally unequal society that runs on the forced labor, the labor, and the exclusion of black people. And it needs violence to enforce it. It needs violence and the threat of violence to enforce it. And that's what the police are. And the police are the expression of the society. They're not the problem in themselves. Um, they're paid by the society to, to enforce the rules of fundamental unfairness. And so I think to pretend that um, you can simply reform the police and make them nicer and stop killing black people has been proven wrong for 400 years. And I think the idea that, you know, that there's a way to just sweep this all back under the rug is, I pray, is over, mm. right? Um, there's a, there's a, I had a meeting last night with a, a group of clergy here in San Francisco. And, um, you know, one of them was very strong talking about um, the need to end white innocence. All right, to end the perception of white innocence, the, the belief in white innocence, and the uh, the pretend blindness um, of, of what's going on. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really, it's a really painful moment. And there have been many, many painful moments before. Um, yeah, I think what you see in the police response around the country is standard right, which is the police will, if you accuse the police of killing people, they will kill you for it. Mm. Or they will beat you up, right? That there is, yeah. that they see this as a fundamental threat to their power and that their power comes from being able to enforce by violence the rules that are convenient for white people. Mm -hmm. I think it's not... Um, I think it's not surprising, that, um, it's slightly satisfying, but not entirely surprising that all the um, white liberals who want to distinguish between the good protesters and the bad ones, um, mm -hmm. if they venture out, they're getting beat up too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Right. What, do you, what do you make of like the police chief in uh, Minneapolis? I mean, I saw on CNN, his, uh, he went to the site, he knelt. Um, there happened to be Sarah Seidner uh, had uh, had him interviewed while some of the family of George Floyd were um, were on CNN with Don Lemon at the time, and through the two of them, they sort of asked him what his response was. Uh, I was taken by the fact that he took his hat off every time he spoke. He, he clearly, as a person, uh, had empathy and wanted to show that. And we've seen other displays across the country, of course, of people, uh, Flint here in, in uh, Flint Township and nearby in Michigan of, of the sheriff marching with the people. Uh, what do you make of that? Is there any, is, does that give us some hope? What would the prophet Amos say about <laughs> that? <laughs> what is true repentance? Mm -hmm. Right. Is true repentance wearing sackcloth and putting ashes on your head? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if, if the police chief of Minneapolis wants to disband the police union, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, That's but, meaningful. You know, I just think I, I don't pretend that I don't pretend that individual police are not human beings the way I am and that they have feelings and they have regrets and they have repentance, but actual change is not about their feelings. No. And there are systems that need 
uh, addressing. As you say, the police are one function of a larger. I heard to one guy on CBC radio here uh, last night when I was listening saying um, that, you know, um, the systems of racism are in every aspect of our societies. So if we think fixing the police is, is, is the goal, then we're missing the broader issue, which is, right. Uh, you know, as you had just said, we're talking about a system and a, and a culture which has kept people down for far too long. Right. So it would be nice to get rid of the the piece of that society that kills people. Yes. Yeah. Directly. Yeah. And then yeah. you can work on the parts that kill people indirectly. Yes, right. What's happening in San Francisco? Have the demonstrations been... Yeah, there. I mean, I haven't been out because, as my daughter likes to tell me, I'm a vulnerable elder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there are demonstrations here, there are demonstrations in Oakland, there are demonstrations shutting down the bridge between Oakland and San Francisco. There's a lot going on in the South Bay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think people are furious. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think people are really furious and I think it's, um, it's partly because the response of the police almost everywhere has been to step up the violence. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, and we certainly saw a picture of that uh, last night in Washington and wanted to uh, get to talk to Sarah about, about last night, just to tell our listeners, and those tuning in, we're recording this on June the 2nd today. Mm -hmm. Last night, Monday night was, um, what happened in Washington that we were all watching. Um, I was in a discussion group last night, uh, a group I do called Education for Ministry with some lay people, and we were talking about the Christian response to to this, uh, what was happening in the United States with all the uprisings. And we were, we were chatting about that at the time everything was happening in Washington, so I didn't see it going on live because I was on on Zoom with, with my folks. But, um, uh, but Sarah, here in Canada, we, we were watching what's happening. Uh, in the United States and with the Trump administration, we've wondered kind of maybe what the bottom would look like, um, especially over these last few years watching this. And yesterday we reached that new law in Washington. He had peaceful protesters tear gassed uh, out of Lafayette Square in Washington so that he could do a photo op really in front of St. John's Episcopal Church holding a Bible. And we know that these folks were violently moved out of the way. There were church people there from St. John's handing out water and granola bars and comforting those that were maybe injured or afraid and giving them some refuge and, and the police just pushed through so that he could get there and, and hold a Bible up in front of the church. So that's kind of the image of what we've had over the last 18 hours now or so in our minds and on our social media. I wanted to get your reaction to that last night, uh, your reaction to what you were thinking at the time and, and how it's sitting with you today. It was interesting that, um, Bishop Buddy, uh, Miriam Buddy, who's the uh, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, um, her comment was that she was outraged, which I thought was a, a good place to go. Um, and this morning, uh, Trump was going to visit the Catholic shrine run by the Knights of Columbus in Washington. And um, the Archbishop of Washington uh, also said he was outraged about that and talked about respecting the dignity of everyone. So I'm glad to see them standing up. Um, and I'm glad to see them um, really standing with people. I mean, I think the important thing that St. John's did was to welcome people in, to give them actual sanctuary and to protect them. And I think that's incredibly important. I also think it's, you know, it's, it's easy to say, that the problem is Trump. Um, I would be very happy if it, it were that clear to every single rector in every Episcopal church in the country that there's no room for an American flag in your sanctuary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would also be useful for the Episcopal church to continue to move in the path that it said and backed off from and said and backed off from and it's moving, but it's very slow to, to recognize that it's literal buildings and it's wealth was accumulated through slavery. Right. 
So it's not as if the church exists or the Christian response exists apart from the world, right? I mean, the church is implicated in this completely. We're not outside of it. And so the responses that we make have to not simply be in condemning others, but in saying, Lord, have mercy on us sinners, mm-hmm. right? Because we're in it too. Yeah, that's another veil that's been lifted, as you mentioned that at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Another veil of the church that perhaps we just didn't want to look at, but it's certainly evident and we're naming it. And right. that's so important. Right. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to be happening in the next few weeks. I don't think things are going to quiet down very quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, as you said at the beginning, I mean, about it's overdue, right? Like it, it's, it, uh, I, it, um, I worry that, you know, like so many other things over these last few years, there's, a, there's, there's the outrage and then everybody sort of goes back to, okay, but now we just wait for the next thing that, that makes us outraged. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but there seems to be, I, it feels like there's something different about this. It feels like, um, there's some, uh, there's some genuine concern. And I take heart in hearing, um, bishops, not just say they're outraged, but say, we need to repent. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, and we need to hear more of that, right? We need to hear more of, uh, you know, I, I, um, I've been trying to reach out to people and, um, in the Afro-Canadian community who I know and say, what do I need to do? Can I listen? Um, I'm sorry for the ways I've participated in these systems. How can I be present? Yeah, you know, I would I would like to give a plug for a book. Uh, I don't know the author at all, but I think it's an excellent book. Um, it's called Dear White Christians by Jennifer yeah. Harvey. Yeah. And um, what's really interesting to me about that book is is the – historical study she did of churches that were asked for to do reparations and basically refused, right? (laughs) White churches that basically refused. And it's really compelling because I think the, um, the argument that she makes is when a great wrong is done, it's not simply about saying it, it's about repairing it. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do you actually repair and make amends to move forward? And I think so often what the church has tried to do is to move, you know, to sort of gloss over the actual wrong that's been done and the Mm -hmm. responsibility of the perpetrators to do something about that and to say, why can't we just be reconciled? Mm -hmm. That we can just be reconciled by being sorry. Right. Right. And again, I think um, the the challenge for the church, as it is the challenge for each one of us as individuals or our own parishes or um, cities, is not just to say we're sorry, not just to say there's a problem and we recognize there's a problem, but to say how what can we do materially and spiritually to repair that. Right. Yeah, here here in Canada, how it sort of comes as I listen to you, I think about we, we've just come through in these last few years of truth and reconciliation time right. um, with our First Nations and our Indigenous peoples. And and what you're saying rings true. And in the church, we're happy to hear those read and we're happy to hear what the recommendations are, but we're not necessarily so happy about what that means for us in terms of, of uh, real action and, and really putting... Uh, meat sort of onto it and knowing that it's going it, to, it, that uh, to use a Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's costly discipleship that, you know, it, it requires. Uh, and I remember, you know, we, we were suffering in this diocese under a, a really large lawsuit, um, totally justified. Uh, and it was a $3 billion thing. It got mm-hmm. settled by the government. The government paid it out and each parish was then responsible to pay a certain amount of reparation. Uh, mm-hmm. For that, and I remember at the time in my parish when this came to parish council, and it was a, a sum of three thousand dollars or something. Um, the vitriol and the anger and the outrage of why are we paying this? This has nothing to do with us, you know. This was, yeah, yeah this, this this was some other time, you know. We're we're and and until we can cross over that hurdle, 
you know, mm-hmm. where we, where we, and I, so I, I'll, I'll be interested. I'll be getting that book. I mean, it sounds like, because it's that sort of mentality. I think that all of us need to sort of take some minds, particularly those of us in leadership. If we're not prepared to say it, how in the hell do we expect uh, people who are leading to take that on? Right. 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 No, it's a very interesting study, including, you know, how they formed these, study groups and actually how the process of going through that was part of it, right? And, and how, how it really changed people's approach. Yeah. All right, just uh, um, to switch gears a little bit, we, we, it's been an interesting thread here on our podcast lately that the table keeps coming up. Um, uh, the Eucharistic table, but also our tables and the tables that we, that we where we celebrate Eucharistio in a sense of, you know, in all the places. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had Matthew Kamig on, and I don't know if you've seen his book, which is called Hospitality in the Age, uh, Hospitality in the Age of Muslim Immigration, uh, m- uh, Hospitality in Muslim Immigration in Age of Fear. Sorry, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll get it right in a minute. Um, and uh, he talked about, rather than building walls, extending well-laid tables where all can flourish. And just last week, we had Diana Butler-Bass on, and we continued in a way that conversation because she was talking about the, the sort of contrasting images of empire and pyramid building as opposed to, you know, again, dining together, breaking bread together at tables. Um, your own story, your personal story of conversion uh, is, is profoundly about being fed and nourished and the ministry that you've lived since that has really been a lot about that. Uh, your coming to faith is rich with the imagery of dinner, dinner of food and particularly as it re- uh, relates to the Eucharist. You wrote in your book, uh, but as well as an intimate memoir of personal conversion, mine is a political story at a moment when right wing, right wing American Christianity is ascendant when religion worldwide is rife with fundamentalism and exclusionary ideology ideological crusades, I stumbled into a radically inclusive faith centered on sacraments and action. What I found wasn't about angels or going to church or trying to be good in a pious, idealized way. It wasn't about arguing a doctrine, the virgin birth, predestination, the sinfulness of homosexuality and divorce, or pledging blind allegiance to a denomination. I was, as the prophet said, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I found it at the eternal and material core of Christianity body, blood, bread, wine, poured out freely, shared by all. I discovered a religion rooted in the most ordinary yet subversive practice, a dinner table where everyone is welcome, where the poor, the despised, and the outcast are honored. I just wonder for some of our listeners who may not be as familiar with you as we are, uh, if you can share a little bit of that conversion story with us. And further to that, I guess, that was a number of years ago. Uh, in terms of talking about that sort of right-wing ascendancy. Uh, we've now seen this populism the world over and this use of populism to divide us. Uh, why does that subversive practice still resonate? Why is it perhaps even more critical than ever? If you could share. Well, you make me really miss communion in a church <laughs> mm-hmm. in the flesh. Yeah. Um, I do, and I I really miss that enormously. And again, I think my my own conversion story is not necessarily the it's not the one that necessarily is a model for anybody else because God has a bizarre sense of humor and works in <laughs> in strange ways. But for me, um, really, I wasn't interested in going to church. I didn't have a vision of going to church. I didn't wasn't a seeker. Um, but I went into the building and took communion, and it was the complete physicality of that, um, very material, very real, actual bread, actual wine, um, that sort of knocked me upside the head with a, a mystical experience. So I have, um, I have enormous respect for people who find their way to God through intellectual struggle or spiritual practices and prayer. But for me, it was somebody gave me a piece of bread and um, gave me something to drink. And that was like um, an experience that of having God who I didn't believe in um, be completely alive and, and actually in my mouth in that. So um, that really changed the way that 
I think that shaped, and not changed, I would say that formed the way that um, I became a believer, that formed the way that I began to practice my faith. Um, because it was so rooted in this immediate and um, physical reality. I feel that um, right now, when you talk about populism and what it means to be open, it, it's always a challenge, right? I mean, the church has always tried to control access to the table. It's always made who gets to receive communion, who gets to distribute communion, who's allowed to taste it, who's excluded from it. I mean, those are all the rules that sustain the church as well. Yeah. Um, so it's not as if suddenly there's a shrinking in. I think that there's always been this conflict between um, the church believing that the table is, belongs to the church. Um, you know, it's that, that word that you used before, Kevin, I think is, is really always a, a sign to me of something. When we talk about hospitality, mm -hmm. um, it's as if we think we're the hosts, right? There's <laughs> but, the part. <laughs> right. Yes, but we're, exactly. not, we're not actually the hosts, right? The host, the host is the meal. <laughs> That's right. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think yeah. the and it's not that we need to open our table to visitors or strangers or people of other faiths or whomever. We need to understand that it's not our table um, and that it's God's table and it wasn't made for us above and apart from anybody else, it was right. made for everyone. Right. Yeah. It reminds me when I was a when I had my first parish, and I was maybe my first month there, and I was showing we were having a church function, and the sanctuary was open, and a lady brought her grandson into the sanctuary, and the kid was four or five, and just bolted right up to the altar, right? Mm -hmm. Just you know, and grandma starts yelling at him, hey, "Get away from there! Get away from there!" Um, but it was in that moment I thought this is where we're we're missing it that this this drawing this child to this holy space mm -hmm. is not about something we need to protect. <laughs> right. yeah, Don't but, you think it's like freaky that so many churches put rails, rails around yeah. the altar? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My rail was open that day. I felt bad for a minute. Like I did something wrong. <laughs> it's like wow, you have to have a fence. It's a fence. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, a fence and, yeah. And and the history of that whole thing around, you know, fences being built in open worship spaces in the early church to keep out the animals, sort of like it's, it's it's offensive to me. I remember not so long ago, actually, at a at a worship service here, uh, where the person who was coming up to help administer with communion came ahead of the Eucharistic prayer, uh, just a physical way of of our layout. And when that person arrived, took the big gate that goes in between and mm -hmm. put it in before I started, and I I just said no. Sorry, I won't go on until yeah. that because it's a pretty wide open thing apart from that big. And I thought, no, I can't do this because I can't. The, the image of the altar and the table being fenced in uh, mm -hmm. for, for the Holy of Holies to be in there. I mean, it's just, it's, and I was thinking about, you know, at a clergy conference recently, what is that, Rob? Maybe a couple of years ago, we had Nadia Bowles Weber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nadia was speaking at our clergy conference here. Someone asked the question. Uh, how do you have as many adult conversions and baptisms? Like, how does that happen? I mean, your, your story, Sarah, is a testimony to it, right? You walked in, you took communion. Um, and so she just said, she said, well, we, we include people from the minute they arrive. We don't, we don't differentiate. We don't distinguish. We don't say you have to reach certain levels. And we just, we give communion to everybody. And that's just what we do. And it was important for us to be reminded at that time by the church that we don't have an open table. Uh, mm -hmm. that people have to be baptized to come. It was important that we be reminded. Yeah, and don't so forget. <laughs> don't forget. Um, and I just, it, it, it was a stark reminder that well, of what you're saying is true, that the church has always behaved as though it was ours to protect, that we are the host. Um, and uh, we really need to get over it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I don't know who we think we're protecting Jesus from. <laughs> so I, I well, you know, he's like he just runs around and talks to anybody. Jesus has no taste at all. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's what are you doing to those people over there? Yeah. You watch out, because if you let them out from behind the fence, who knows? But, you know. <laughs> I'm right. scared okay. to let Jesus out. <laughs> yeah. Keep, I, I, I love that the tabernacle has a lock on it. It's like, oh, <laughs> let's keep them locked in there. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's his. Uh, it's like his safety room. We put him in there and we lock the doors. Like, okay, you're safe. <laughs> um, Sarah, loved your book, Jesus Freak. Um, really enjoyed that. I know Ian wanted to ask you a question about that, so I want to make sure Ian gets a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking about him. So, in your book, Jesus Freak, you write, Jesus doesn't show us how to make a blind man see, dry every tear, or even drive out all kinds of demons. But he shows us how to enter into a way of life in which broken and sick pieces are held in love and given meaning in which strangers literally touch each other and doing so make a community spacious enough for everyone in which the deepest desires of our hearts draw us to health. Don't be afraid. Jesus said your faith will make you well. And hopefully there could be some positive stories happening in this podcast. Um, but can you share with share a story with us of seeing that opening and welcoming space to someone as well? I mean, we were talking about, yeah, um, I mean, I think I, it's interesting. I, I'm interested why you chose that chapter because I love that healing chapter and it's been a real struggle because, you know, I don't want to feel bad <laughs> and I don't want to be sick and I don't want people to suffer. It just sucks. So um, I really understand the why we want why we want a cure instead of healing, mm -hmm. right? Why we want Jesus to fix things instead of to heal us mm -hmm. because it sucks to be sick and it would be so great if Jesus could be the magic wand that repaired, you know, my neighbor's coronavirus or, you know, my mom's death or anything like that. But I mean, I just think that, healing is not cure, right? It's like the, the meaning that we find is more than the effectiveness of, of an outcome, you know? And I think one of the stories I wrote about in Jesus Freak really stays with me because it's so unfinished. Mm. Well, it's finished in one sense, but unfinished in another, because it's not, it wasn't okay. It was this guy who would come to our food pantry, Big Jim, who was really, he was what you call a falling down drunk. I mean, he was, he drank so much, he would just fall down, you know, make a mess, fight with people. I mean, just terrible. And he was killing himself. He, had, he was dying of liver disease. And all of us just got so mad at him. Like all of the recovering alcoholics would say, just come on, we'll help you. Well, everyone else would just shout at him when he got so drunk and obstreperous. And I just was infuriated by the way he would come and mess everything up and be unmanageable. And then you'd have to like get in the car and drive him home. And, and he finally died. Um, he died of alcohol poisoning. And... It just, it, it was a struggle and it was just amazing when we gathered together to, for his funeral, to see that how many people were connected to him, not connected to him in a blissful way, mm -hmm. like they were pissed off at him, yeah. you know? <laughs> but it was as if he kept coming back to this place where he had conflicts with people because somehow that was healing for him. Mm -hmm. He wasn't fixed. He wasn't cured of his alcoholism. He wasn't cured of his liver disease. We weren't cured of our irritation, mm -hmm. but we were being held together in something. And it was amazing to, to understand that he felt he belonged there. And it turned out we all felt he belonged there mm -hmm. too. Um, just in and around the conflict and the meaning of the belonging was, was what mattered. He found his open table. It sounds like, it, you know, yeah. And he made it for others. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
And I think this is what happened over and over at the food pantry. And I think just because it was, um, you know, the great blessing of the food pantry was that it was totally unmanageable, <laughs> which, yeah. which allowed God to kind of manage it. Um, because it was just a mess. You couldn't, I mean, every single person who worked there would come up at some point with a, a new stab at trying to do a set of rules that would make it manageable, and we never could. Yeah, yeah. yeah God does uh, cool things with chaos. <laughs> right. But it wasn't chaotic. It was just, it didn't, it didn't work by the rules of the world. Right. right? It, you weren't supposed to have a place where you had the little old, Chinese ladies and the big black guy and the gay gym rats and you know yeah, it's just yeah. like we weren't all supposed to be doing this together right right um, and we all brought our own selves and our own sins and our own bad habits and our own sweetnesses too um, but it was a place that operated by a different logic right mm -hmm. the, the logic of what you call the table or even what you mean by healing right? Right. right which is you know when we when you think like that god's basic work is restoring the world to order i think it's very easy to think of that order as a kind of you know like one of those zoological charts or a, a grid of a city and everything will be perfect. But God's sense of order is very different. Yeah. But it's a, it's a wholeness that you see. And I think that that's why the healing is so powerful, right? Because you can be in that moment where you understand the pea-soaked alcoholic who's shouting at you that he doesn't yeah. want to get in your car. Yeah. And you sort of understand your relationship with him as healing you. I, I want to uh, talk a little more about the food pantry because for our listeners that might not be familiar with it, just introduce them to that too a little bit. Um, the food pantry that you founded and now direct feeding, what, upwards of 400 families um, every week and right around uh, the altar at St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. Um, this is just a little bit from your website I want to share with our listeners uh, as a description of the food pantry. At the food pantry, we believe in building community by empowering people to work together and share food with neighbors. The food pantry is short on bureaucracy. We don't ask hungry people to fill out forms or prove they're deserving. Uh, we're strong on participation. Most of our volunteers are folk who come to get food and stay to feed others. The food pantry welcomes everyone to the table, disabled workers, uh, retired grandparents, homeless gay teenagers, middle-aged cleaning ladies, longtime San Franciscans, and new immigrant families from all over the world. And we invite everyone to pitch in. Our volunteers speak a dozen different languages. Uh, some are young and strong, some old and sick. Some live in houses and some in the streets. But at the food pantry every Friday, we share the privilege of doing meaningful work together and feeding our community. I was reading that about the languages on Pentecost Sunday too, so <laughs> I was kind of clicking the other day. But um, you write a lot about the food pantry in your books, and you've shared a little bit today. Um, and maybe you've even answered this question I want to ask, but why is this ministry so important to you? Why does it mean so much to you? Well, I mean, you can say it's, you, it's um, I should say that um, I'm no longer working at the food pantry. And in fact, it's closed down. Oh, really? Uh, I, we weren't aware of that. Yeah. It's, I, not I, in, it's not closed down. It's sort of morphed. Right. It's, it's not in the church anymore. It's in the parking lot. Okay. And what we used to do is just, you can see a beautiful video of it on the food pantry website, uh, yeah. thefoodpantry.org. Um, but we used to set up tables right around the altar. Um, and so people would walk around the altar and pick their own groceries. And now what they're doing is um, getting pre-packed bags and handing them to people um, one at a time or in their car. So it's had to really change a lot. And we're also not allowed to have more than 10 volunteers at a time. Right. right. Whereas it used to be just so many 
people would come in because everybody wanted to be part of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a very different feel to it. It yeah. still feels like church, right? But it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not the same as it was. Um, I think the thing that, I mean, I, as I said, I retired from the food pantry, um, but it's still running. And the, the main point about the food pantry is that it's run by the people who use it, right? It's not run by church people for poor people. It's run by poor people for each other. Right. And to me, that's the most powerful part of the pantry and why it's so life-giving to people. Um, because it's not a charity, right? It's not a good deed. It's not a ministry. Um, it's church. It's like, we're making this happen together and it's fully participatory. And, um, I loved it, loved, loved and missed it. So it's a vision of the kingdom. It is a vision of the kingdom and it's, um, it's sort of ridiculous to be standing there like, with that rotten potato smell and thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how powerful that is the rotten potato smell right around the altar, right around the table that we were talking about earlier, right? Like right. it's, it, that's the, I talk about incarnation and the enfleshing of God's presence, right? Like, I mean, right. It's just really well, when I was uh, telling you about the funeral for um, the guy who died, we did that right around the altar in the middle of the food pantry. Lots you know, we set up, we gave away like four or five tons of groceries that day. We did it. Wow. You know, we sensed all the vegetables and we came up to the altar and we cleared off all the piles of stuff. You know, the, the, the altar is where we keep the exacto knives and the bags and the, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, bits yeah. of string. Cleared that off, put a, put a picture of him, some flowers, prayed, and then gave away the food. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. What I love about that image of, you know, all the stuff on the table, the exacto knife and the string and all that, it's it's like our dinner tables. And it's the real celebration of that Eucharistio, that Thanksgiving, that uh, that maybe, just maybe if we see it and we experience it, even more importantly, we might be able to carry that to our own tables and extend that hospitality to everybody else. I mean, that to me is what was so powerful about all the work that you've done there Um and, and I can't recommend enough uh, the reading of, of all three of those books, to be honest. I mean, uh, but, but certainly uh, that, that book, um, uh, Eat This Bread, Eat This Bread, right? I'm saying it right. Yeah. I, always, I always wonder if it's Eat This Bread or Take This Bread. I've read it twice. I should know the title by now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's, um, it's, to me, it's required reading. I mean, I, I want to put it in the hands of every person who says they want to do ministry, lay or ordain, and say this is – this is a vision of what the kingdom could look like. What, what you folks have done there is make alive. And I think that that's what our people, our, our God's people need, is we need to see it and experience it. So we need to be able to model that in our communities. And if we model it, I mean, that image of, of your, your friend's funeral, mm-hmm. surrounded by food and, and the table and handing out food, and it's, that's, what people, that's what people yearn for. It's a transformative table for yeah. for everyone gathered around it. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. I just uh, I, I had a, uh, just one more question for you, but before I do, I just wanted to show people what that image was. Can you say a word or two about this? Yeah, this is um, Mark Dukes, who's a brilliant um, iconographer. He actually did the dancing saints icon at St. Gregory's Church. Um, he's uh, he. Let me see. He's a deacon in the African Orthodox Church. Um, he's an amazing painter as well as an iconographer. Um, and this was, I don't know whether the title is Mother of Sorrows or Our Lady of Ferguson. You can look at his, um, uh, at his website. But it really, to me, was, it was a powerful moment that he did after the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson. And the way that the hands up, don't shoot posture is the posture of the Orans is just so profound to me. And the way in which um, the mothers of the murdered are the mother of sorrows is 
incredibly profound. I was just on a phone call with a bunch of uh, Latina mothers who were talking about what's going on. And we're just grieving and saying the same thing happens to our kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have very Marian faiths. And, and I think that their understanding of what's happening now in the streets is profound because of that understanding of what it means to be the mother of the crucified. I think that's one of the more powerful things out of that. Uh, as you say, it's just, uh, you know, we get to George Floyd and, and sadly it's, it's a long list, but one of the very striking things about that video is to hear a 46 year old man while dying, crying for his mother. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you don't feel that in here, there's something wrong with you. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. Um, anyway, it, look, we we could. I, I mean, if you'd let us, we would keep you here all day. But I don't think you will. So, <laughs> so, so I better say we got to wrap it up. But before we wrap it up, we got a couple things we need to do. One of them is fun, and the other one is to find out what you're up to now, because I know this COVID time means you're not out speaking, uh, but you may be doing some things online, or you may be doing some writing. You're a very creative and giving uh, soul. And I just wonder what, uh, what you're up to now. What's the next project? Is there anything we should be watching out for? Mm. Well, thank you. Um, I don't feel particularly creative. I feel like everybody else stuck in the house and sort of <laughs> wondering, oh my God, should I really when is it going to be over? Um, but no, for the last three years, I've been working as a community organizer with Faith in Action, which is a, a network of congregations, um, churches, and synagogues uh, in San Francisco and the next county over. Um, and we work to develop leaders who build power to change things in their neighborhoods. So in San Francisco, it's... Um, Heavily Latino, but not entirely. We don't really work. We don't organize around issues as much as around people. Mm. So that's that's my work, and that's what I'm doing, and I'm doing it about. I was a fool to think I could leave the church and get an easier job. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, does it? Well, oh, that's yeah. great. Well, uh, sir, I don't know if you'd be open to this, but we like to always kind of finish up our, our podcast with our guests and do what we like to call the lightning round. Two or three Quick fire questions to you, whatever comes off the top of your head. Okay. okay. And if you do, get, do cows run? Yeah, <laughs> something, something like that. Something well, like you, that. Na yeah. you nailed that one, so this will be no problem for you whatsoever. And if you, if you do real well with these, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get a hold of your daughter and let, let her talk to her about letting your poor mom out of the house. Yes, yeah, just let her out of the house, for heaven's sakes. Okay, so question number one. You're locked in the house, of course. What's Sarah's go-to pandemic food when you got to sit there for weeks on end? Does coffee count as a food? It sure does. Does yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, Steve Young or Joe Montana? I have no idea who those people are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go. How about a baseball question? Oh, please. No? Okay. We're going to oh, say. Please. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many people are on a baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to go I, back I to the like other the one. the most profound lack of interest in any sport okay fine we'll skip the movies. Um, and, and you can skip the movies too while you're at it no 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 movie questions yeah i'm really i'm really kind of useless on all of these fronts don't even okay. try how about this one how about this one favorite churchy word mm, that's 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 a good one i i'd have to think about that a lot but um a spurge is a great verb well, that's a good one. We haven't heard that one before. And then the other side of the question is, churchy word that we really got to get rid of. Oh, um, how, how about a phrase? Yeah. Ah, oh, oh, oh. uh, yeah. There, there's so many of them that really uh, grate on my nerves. I can, I can hardly begin to. to <laughs> all, We've opened a nerves. treasure trove. Um, right. We how got about. A Please be seated. Sorry, say it again. Your hand went over to my. Please mic, be seated. Oh, please be seated. <laughs> yeah, please. Be seated too. Yeah. See, these will wake you up in the middle of the night, and you'll yell one out like this. <laughs> Standing and as you are able. Standing as you are able. That's a good one too. <laughs> All right. 
Well, that's great, Sarah. Thanks so much. We, we really do appreciate you okay. being Okay. Thanks to all work. of you, and yeah. good luck with the project. Thank you. Uh, wish you well, and we wish you safety and, and healing as you move through these times. And uh, know that our prayers are with uh, all of you in the midst of this. And uh, let's play. Let's uh, please God know that uh, that the time is now. That maybe maybe now is the time for the traction to take hold. Yeah. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Take care now. And so, Kevin, we want you to tell everybody where you can find us on the Vickers Crossing, and especially tell everybody about our new website that we just got up. Yes, indeed. Go to the Vickers, uh, www.thevickerscrossing.com. It is an incredible webpage where you can learn all kinds of fantastic little tidbits about us three wild and crazy guys. Uh, but more importantly, you can learn about our upcoming guests. And uh, I just want to highlight a couple of them in the next couple of weeks. We have, uh, in fact, in a couple of days, we'll be speaking with uh, James Smith. Uh, who's from nearby Embro, Ontario, but now makes his home in America as he's a professor over there and is a great speaker, teacher, and author. Next week, we have Emily Scott, who is the founder of St. Lydia's in Brooklyn, uh, which is a, a, uh, a food ministry around table. Uh, we're going to follow her up with uh, even more great guests. We have Karen Gonzalez coming on the podcast. Karen is uh, uh, an advocate for... Um, immigrants and a, a writer and a speaker her book the god who sees is an incredible book and uh, we'd encourage you reading that and we're very excited to have stephen patterson coming up on the podcast in a couple weeks as well and right now we're in the thick of a couple of other people i can't announce them yet but stay tuned and uh, you'll find us on spotify on apple podcasts you'll find us uh, on uh, buzzsprout and wherever basically you like to watch or listen to a podcast. And now that we're in this Zoom format, uh, a lot of you are loving YouTube. So go there. You'll see us in all of our beauty, with all of our fine skin and blemishes. And uh, you'll get to have a look at all of us wherever you see us. All right. And uh, uh, thanks again to Sarah Miles for dropping by. And do recommend her books, folks. Please uh, pick them up. Really transformative reading. And uh, they make great book studies in the parish if you're looking for They for do something. indeed. Uh, those are excellent. And uh, again, thanks to Abel and George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. Uh, we thank them for their support of the podcast. Ian, if I haven't said it again today, you the man. So thanks for all the work you do. Thank you, Kevy. For all Thank you, you buddy. Um, and thanks to our listeners for taking the time to drop by and be part of the Vickers Crossing where uh, faith intersects with the public square. And Kevin, remember to always look both ways. Before you cross the street. Ka-pish!